Well, welcome to our Tuesday evening special midweek Bible study during Thanksgiving week. And I want to wish everyone a happy Thanksgiving. I know everybody's been going 100 miles per hour. It's been such a crazy year. And it's going to be great to sit down with your family and some friends, be able to fellowship a little bit. Uh, probably a little different than we have in the past, but I'm looking forward to the holidays, I'm sure, just as much as you are. So I wish you a very happy Thanksgiving. We had a whole plan tonight to do something totally different. We we're going to have a praise-giving service. We we're going to have family singing. We we're going to do a bunch of different things, and I had to go ahead and get sick and ruin it all. No, we had several people in our church get sick as well as me and just felt like it was the best thing to do to close down. I had made the decision I wasn't closing again unless we had some people in our church get sick. So I'm not going to be foolish about it. I want to make the best decision I can for our local assembly. So uh, looking forward to meeting again one week from this coming Sunday. Tonight I'm going to continue on with my One Thing series. But before we get to that, let me go over a few announcements and bring you up to speed on a few things I want you to know about. Number one, I want to remind everyone that this Thursday, 88.1 WBLW is going to begin uh, broadcasting their Christmas music. Uh, 24 hours a day, am I right, Adam? All the music is going to be Christmas, and then we've got our regular broadcast program throughout the day, except... From 5 to 9. From 5 to 9 at night, sometimes we do some reruns. I think Scott Pauley's uh, broadcast is played again. I think Jack Treber's broadcast is played again and some others. Uh, from Thanksgiving through Christmas, from 5 to 9, all it is going to be, other than news and some station identification IDs, it's going to be full Christmas. Now look, we've got... Great Christmas music in our queue all set up at WBLW, but we also have some of the old classics. I challenge you to go to our church Facebook page or go to the WBLW radio uh, Facebook page and the Living Word Facebook page, and you can see a commercial on there about some of the songs that we'll play. I know it'll be a blessing to you. So that is going to start this Thursday. Then I want to remind you, this Sunday begins our Christmas sermon series. This year's series is Chris Myth Busters. It's almost like Mike Tyson is saying Christmas, okay? Chris Myth Busters is Christmas with a lisp, and we're going to be talking about some of these myths. Um, as a matter of fact, this coming Sunday, Sunday morning, I'm going to be talking about, my title is The Great I Am, and the myth is this, the birth of Jesus marked the beginning of his impact on the world. Well, that's a myth, uh, the truth is this, Jesus is part of the eternal Godhead. He's always been making uh, an impact on the world, uh, pre-birth, birth, life, and post-life. So we're going to talk about that a little bit. And then Sunday evening, on uh, November 29th, we'll be talking about the Bible, God's history book. The myth is this. The myth is the average nativity scene is an accurate depiction of of what the Bible teaches. Now, I love nativity scenes. We're going to have one here uh, next week, right here on the Lord's Supper table. And uh, it's where it's all together. But the myth is, is that's exactly what happened. The fact of the matter is, that's not exactly how it happened. The truth is this that we're going to talk about. Traditions can distort but God's word never changes. So I want you to be in your place. We'll be online, uh, Facebook Live, YouTube. On Sunday morning, we'll be on WBLWradio.com as well as 88.1, and then we'll be on YouTube and Facebook on Sunday night. But you won't want to miss as we begin our Christmas sermon series. And then also want to remind you, we will be online Sunday morning, Sunday night, and next Wednesday. But one week from this Sunday, we'll be meeting in person once again on December the 6th. So I want to invite you out and be a part of our services. We're starting back up our Wednesday night, patch program, everything. We'll have our uh, coffee bar in the morning. We're looking forward to, to all of that. Uh, a couple other things I want to let you know about some things that are going on next week. I want to remind you to be praying that our billboards will be going up next week, promoting 88.1 and the Christmas music. I want to also ask you to be in prayer as our mail out almost 
almost 12,000 different homes. We're sending our mail out that lets them know that uh, Christmas music is available, the sermon series is available, and if they want a gift, this, this book called a, a Christmas Gift, we've received those. We're ready to give them out for free just to be a blessing to our community. So that's all going to be happening next week. And then one brand new thing. I want you to be looking on the Living Word Facebook page and our church Facebook page. We have a brand new thing we're going to do in the on the radio in the mornings throughout the holiday seasons all the way up to Christmas. It's called Merry and Bright from 8.30 to 9 o'clock, Monday through Friday. It'll be both Adam and myself will be doing a live radio broadcast. It's supposed to be live. There may be a couple that are pre-recorded, but we are planning on being live. Don't I don't know who is Merry and who is Bright, but we are going to be there, and that is our goal to kind of Spread some holiday cheer. So starting next Monday through Friday, we'll be on the radio live from 8.30 to 9 with a brand new little holiday special called Merry and Bright. And then before we get into tonight's Bible study, I want to remind everyone to uh, stay up in your giving. I've been here all day today. Adam's been here. We've had church members dropping off their giving. We've uh, received it online. Uh, people have been sending it in the mail. Thank you for your faithfulness through this crazy time once again. Also want to remind you to uh, earmark your Christmas gift. I think we're at 1300 is what we need more uh, to make up the thing that we voted on. We needed 2000 I believe 700 have come in. And so we'll be talking more about that as time goes on, especially on the 6th. But uh, if you have any questions, go ahead, give us a call. But I'll be here and Adam will be here all day tomorrow if you want to stop by. The offices will be closed on Thursday and Friday. And then we'll be here Monday through Friday if you want to stop by and bring in your gifts. All right, tonight I'd like you to take your Bibles, if you would, please. And I'd like you to go to John chapter 9. Would you do that, please? John chapter 9 is where I will be looking at tonight. I'm continuing this evening on our One Thing series. Tonight's thought is one word, testify. This is the fourth study in our One Thing series, our One Things in the Bible. The first one was pressing toward the mark. We looked at Philippians where Paul said, but this one thing I do, and we talked about pressing toward the mark. That was study number one. Study number two was a study on God's timetable. Uh, Peter chapter, uh, 1 Peter chapter 3 says, Beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing, that one day is with the Lord as a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day. So we looked at pressing toward the mark. We looked at God's timetable. Last time we talked about this, we talked about God's provision. And we looked at Joshua 23, verse 14, not one thing has failed when they were wandering through the wilderness. And we talked about how God takes care of us. But tonight's study comes from the book of John. And it comes from a former blind man who was healed. And this man that we find, we're introduced to, he wasn't just blind, he was blind since birth. He could never see. He never knew what it was like to see. And before we consider our one thing in Scripture, I want you to allow me to give you some background to our story about this blind man that's going to get healed. John chapter 9 opens with Jesus noticing this blind man and the Bible reveals to us very plainly that this man had been blind since he was born. And the disciples asked the Lord, whose sin caused this blind man, uh, blindness, this man or his parents? There was a common kind of a Jewish belief at the time that all suffering was a result of sin. So when they saw somebody who was crippled or they saw someone who was deaf or was mute or was blind, they automatically assumed that was a result of sin. Well, if they would have studied back and looked at the book of Job, they'd realize that not all suffering is a result of sin. But anyways, that was their question. Lord, who sinned that made this man blind? John chapter 9, uh, verses 3 through 5, if you've got your Bibles, I would like you to look. Jesus gives the reason for this man's blindness. The Bible says, Jesus answered, Neither hath this man sinned, nor his parents but that the works of God should be made manifest in him. He says, I must work the works of him that sent me while it is day. The night cometh when no man can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. So Jesus makes it very clear. This man has been blind since birth, but it's not because of his sin. It's not because of the sin of his parents. 
this blindness had a purpose behind it, that God was going to use this to magnify the wonderful works of God. So following this statement, Jesus is going to spit on the ground. He's going to take his spittle and he's going to kind of mix it with the dirt there. It's going to kind of form, form like a little clay, a little bit mud. And then he's going to apply that to this blind man's eyes. And he's going to tell this gentleman, he's going to instruct him to go wash in the pool of Siloam. And so this man who's blind obeys. He goes down to this pool. He washes and guess what? Just like Naaman, he's healed. He can see. I mean, for the first time in his life, he can see the color of grass and the color of the sky, and he can see what people look like, and he doesn't have to be led around. I mean, this is amazing, absolutely amazing, an amazing miracle. And by the way, everybody is astonished. Uh, they start asking, is not this the man who sat by day after day, begging. As a matter of fact, they're going to get into a big debate about it. No, he's not that man. He looks like that man. And there's this big debate. Is he the one? I've heard that he got healed. I heard that this man has been a beggar for a long time. So there's this big old debate. And enough of discussion, the people begin, they, they, they just go ahead and they ask him, are you the one that was blind and now you can see? And as uh, all this man knows, all he knows is what he can tell them is what happened. And that's exactly what he does. John chapter 9, <coughs> verse number 9, or excuse me, John chapter 9, verse number 11. He answered and said, a man that is called Jesus made clay and anointed my eyes and said unto me, go to the pool of Siloam and wash. And I went and washed and I received sight. So they're all asking him. We just got to ask you, are you... Are you the one that used to sit here day after day begging because you were blind? And he says, I was. They said, well, what happened? He said, this man named Jesus, he made clay and he put it on my eyes. He told me to go to the pool of Siloam and wash. And I did. And I received my sight. Well, this is a big, big deal. So then he's brought before the religious crowd, before the Pharisees. They catch wind of this. And they all want to see. They've been following this Jesus and they've been hearing about him. And so they... They drag this man before him, and it is, uh, it's now that they're going to be enlightened that this deed, or excuse me, now in the Bible, we're enlightened that it caught the Pharisees' attention because the deed that Jesus did, this healing, happened on the Sabbath day, and that was a no-no for them. I mean, tradition says you can't do anything on the Sabbath day, uh, and, and there's a bunch of hypocrisy. So they're after Jesus. Now the Pharisees, they ask him, the one who had received this sight, and the former blind man rehearses his story. He says, look, this, I've been blind my whole life. This man comes, he form, makes clay, puts it on my eyes, tells me to go to the pool of Siloam. I do, and I can see. I don't even know who this guy is. I know his name is Jesus. That's it. Now, rather than rejoice in the miracle, the topic of discussion turns to whether Jesus is a man of God or a sinner. And, I mean, after all, I mean, he healed on the Sabbath day, so he must be a sinner. So now they're going to start making a big deal and say, don't, don't thank this guy. Give God the praise. This guy is a sinner. And that's where the discussion takes place with the Pharisees. And so I asked this healed man what he thinks. Do you think he's a healer? Do you think the healer is God or, or, or a prophet, or do you think he's a sinner? And the Bible interjects here that the religious crowd did not believe that he used to be blind. Now, I want to remind you that he is a grown man. He's of age. He can speak on his behalf. He doesn't need his mommy and daddy there. But nonetheless, they're going to go seek out his parents, and they're going to say, is this your son? Is he telling the truth? Did he, was he born blind, and now he can see? I mean, I would be a little frustrated. Uh, look, I'm a grown man. I can speak for myself. I'm not lying. I was blind my whole life. Well, we're going to bypass you. Let's go get your parents. Is this your son? It is. Was he, was he born blind? He was. And his parents confirmed that this man is their son and he was born blind. But for the reason of the healing, they didn't want to get involved. They said, he's of age. Ask him. Ask him how it happened. Now, the Bible lets us know that 
They said this because they were afraid that if anybody confessed to Jesus, they were going to kick him out of the synagogue. And mom and dad were more worried about being booted out of the synagogue than they were standing with their own son. And so they say, ask him. And so this man is brought before the crowd again. And he's told to give God the praise, not this sinner. And I imagine at this point, this guy has got to be just absolutely frustrated to no end. I mean, he's sitting here going, I can see I couldn't before. Mom and dad, you know, my whole life you've had to walk me around and hold my hand and help me out. And, and you've always wished I could see and now I can see. And now we're going to have a debate on whether the man that healed me is a man of God or not. And so they ask him again, and he says, you ask me again? You ask me about who it was that healed me? He says, I'll tell you one thing. I'll tell you all that I know. And by the way, there's, there's much I don't know. But this blind man says, this is the one thing that I do know. John chapter 9, verse 25, pick up our story. The Bible says, and he answered and said, whether he be a sinner or no, whether he's a sinner or not, I know not. I don't know. But one thing I know, that whereas I was blind, now I see. This man says, there's a lot I don't know. And as for this man that healed me, I don't know whether he's a sinner or not. But I know one thing. The one thing that I know is I used to be blind. Now I can see. Praise God. So he is asked again after this how Jesus made him blind. And this is where it gets a little intense. You know, uh, sometimes people can't see the forest for the trees, can they? I mean, truth can be staring them right in the face and they miss it. It ends up with the Pharisees exalting themselves because unlike this man, uh, they were not born in sins. He kind of rebukes them. This blind guy says, look, if I tell you again, will you be his disciples? He's like, weren't Moses' disciples? We weren't born in sin like you were. They had this idea that he was a sinner because he was blind and him or his parents had done something wrong. And you know what? I think about this man. He was healed so that he could see how ugly and cruel the world can be. Isn't that sad? All alone now, cast out. I mean, he used to be all alone as, as a beggar who couldn't see. Now he's got his sight back. and He's all alone. He's been ridiculed. What should be the greatest day of his life is one of the most heartbreaking, you know, so he's all alone, he's cast out, he's frustrated, and guess who meets him? You guessed it, Jesus shows up again. And they're going to have a conversation. The Bible says in John chapter 9, verse 35, if you'd look at it with me, Jesus heard that they had cast him out. And when he had found him, he said unto him, Dost thou believe on the Son of God? And he answered and said, who is he, Lord, that I might receive, that I might believe on him? And Jesus said unto him, Thou hast both seen him, and it is he that talketh with thee. And he said, Lord, I believe. And the Bible says, and he worshiped him. I mean, no sooner he had been healed, all he had received, even from family, was ridicule. And Jesus finds him again. And Jesus goes right after the heart, right after the heart of the problem. He says, dost thou believe in the Son of God? And he said, who is he, Lord, that I might believe on him? And Jesus said unto him, thou hast both seen him, and it is he that talked with thee. And he, and he believed. He became a Christian. He was born again, and he worshiped God. You know, all that matters in the end is Jesus. At the end of our story, take all of John chapter 9, and you can take that story of what those people did, and you can throw that in the garbage can, because all that matters is at the end, Jesus is going to show up. And he's the only one that matters anyways. And in the end, it's Jesus and what he thinks and what he is to us. That's all that mattered. This man may not have known much, but he did know one thing. And it's that one thing that he spoke about. I remind you, he answered 
Whether he be a sinner or no, I know not. One thing I know. What's the one thing he knows? He says, whereas I was blind, but now I see. One thing he knew, and he testified about it. That's my thought tonight. Testify. Testify. Listen, you may not know much. As a matter of fact, we probably know a lot less than we care to admit. But if you know Jesus as your Savior, then you know one thing and you know it for sure. This blind man, I don't know a lot, but I can tell you one thing. I was blind, now I see, and this Jesus came and he preached the gospel unto me and I believed on him and I worshiped him. That's the one thing I do know. You know what I've learned? That a lot of people know a lot of things, but they might not know the Lord and it's the one thing they need to know. And for those of us that have trusted the Lord as our Savior, we've been born again, that's the one thing that we need to be sure about that we testify. We may not know much, but we can all testify to the work that God has done in our lives. Some of us, we were spiritually dark in sin. We were blind. And one day, it was a preacher or a friend of ours preached the gospel unto us, and we got born again, and we can now see, and there's a lot we don't know, but we know this, of what God has done in our hearts. And all we can do is tell others about it and testify. It's the one thing that this blind man said, I know, and I'm going to tell you about it. And the one thing that you know and the one thing that I know, if we've been saved, we can tell others about Christ testify I love what the Bible says in Psalm 107 verse 2 the Bible tells us let the redeemed of the Lord say so whom he hath redeemed from the hand of his enemy God says my people ought to say something about being redeemed hey first Peter chapter 3 tells us but sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear, having a good conscience that whereas they spake evil of you, as of evildoers, they may be ashamed that falsely accuse your good conversation in Christ. Mark 16, 15 says, And he said unto them, Go ye into the world and preach the gospel to every creature. We are supposed to say something. And you don't have to be a Bible scholar. God said, Just talk about the one thing that you do know the change that I've made in your life. We can speak with boldness about what we do know. And the truth that Jesus is real to us and has made a saving salvation change in our lives, that is worth testifying about. If you know Christ is your Savior, if you've been born again, then you can say like this healed man, this one thing I know, I once was blind, but now I see. You know, we know much, or we think we know much, but we're probably not as sure about all that we know as we think we are. Many times it's more like, well, we think, or I think, and I'm pretty sure. But you know what? Things change, don't they? You know, there's things when I was growing up, they said, hey, eat this every day, or this is healthy. And now they tell you, don't eat that. I think about, um, there's certain stretches they used to have you do when you're getting ready for football practice and basketball practice and when you're getting ready to work out. And then now, as time goes on, they say, oh, don't do those stretches. Those are actually bad for you. We think we know so much. By the way, I'll just interject this with the COVID thing. From the CDC to local government, have you noticed, and by the way, I'm following all the rules that I possibly can. I mean, I had COVID. I did the, did the uh, quarantine. I did what the doctor said I needed to do. But it's funny, the phone calls I get, the texts I get, the letters I get, the things I get from the health department, the CDC, and all that kind of stuff, and, and the things I see out there in the news, are you all getting your information from the same place? Because one is saying you got to quarantine this long. The other one's saying you got to do it this long. One thing you got to do it, I'll just do what my doctor told me to do. The whole point is, not all experts are experts. <laughs> We're learning that. And by the way, do what the CDC tells you to do. Do what, you, do what you're told to do. I'm just making the point that not all the experts are on the same page. 
We're not as sure about everything as we think we are. But the one thing that we do know is the one thing we can be dogmatic about, and that was at one time I was blind spiritually, but because of Christ, now I can see. Look, the world may ask us over and over and over and try to understand, but they are not going to truly understand until they know Christ like we know Christ. Look, do we know anything for sure? Yes, we do. God's word and what he has done in our hearts and our lives. But that's the one thing that we can be bold about. It's funny, we get bold about politics, we get bold about sports, we get bold about certain philosophical views. And we could be right, we could be wrong. They're just opinions. But God's word will always be right. And what God has done in your heart and done in my heart for salvation will always be right. So what is it that we truly know? I tell you, testify. Well, let's testify about what we really know. What is it that we really knew? Well, what we really know, the list is probably smaller than we realize. What we do know is what we have seen and what we have heard and what we've experienced for ourselves. So the best testimony is a testimony that is first-hand knowledge. You know, the apostles were constantly scrutinized for, or scrutinized concerning Jesus. If you read through the book of Acts, you'll find they were beat, they were mocked, they were imprisoned, they were martyred. You say, why go through all of that? I mean, you look at the apostles. Why go through all of those things? I'll tell you why, because they were firsthand witnesses of what God had done they could not speak but for what they had seen and what they had heard and what they had observed. They saw it. It wasn't a fairy tale. They watched Christ. They handled the word of God. They saw it. And they had firsthand knowledge. As a matter of fact, in the book of Acts, chapter number 5, I'm not going to take the time to read it all here, but I, I would recommend that you start reading, read 17 through verse 42, and you'll find the disciples are preaching the word of God. The magistrates, the leaders of this particular town, they come, they take them, they bind them, they beat them. They tell them not to speak in the name of Jesus anymore. And they've got them in prison, and they... They escape and they get out and they're having this big old council about the disciples and all of this stuff and they go to get them and bring them and they say, they're not in the prison. They're out preaching the very thing we told them not to say. And they drag them before the council again and I'm reading from Acts chapter number five, beginning in verse number 29. This is after they've been beat, after they've been scourged, after they've been told not to preach in this man's name anymore. They had him in prison and they got out. And here's Peter's response. Then Peter and the other apostles answered. They're all answering and said, We ought to obey God rather than men. The God of our fathers raised up Jesus, whom ye slew and hanged on a tree. Him hath God exalted with his right hand to be a prince and savior, for to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. Now listen to this. They're rebuking this group. And they're saying, you put him on the cross and you killed him. But he was the prince of peace. And they said, and we are his witnesses of these things. We're not just hearing this and we came here and got all caught up in it. We watched it. It's something that we know. We have firsthand knowledge. And we are as witnesses of these things, and so is also the Holy Ghost whom God hath given to them that obey him. The Bible says, and when they heard that, they were cut to the heart and took counsel to slay them. They were so angry, so angry at these apostles, but these apostles were simply testifying about what they knew, what they had seen to be true, just like our blind man. This one thing I know, I could tell you this, I was blind and now I can see testify their declaration is this is not heresy but rather we're witnesses of what we're talking about in today's study about one things we're challenged to testify about what we know to be true our testimony 
with work, our testimony with friends, our influence on our family. Our life ought to scream out the one thing that we do know, and that is Jesus is king. He saved my soul. We ought to say it. We ought to live it. It ought to be the one thing that we do know. And by the way, we're not just talking about what somebody else's experience is. We are firsthand witnesses to the miracle and the handiwork of God in our own lives. I know one thing. God has made a change in me. God has made a supernatural, supernaturally has worked in my life. And you can't, you can try to explain it to somebody. When I tell people about my salvation experience and how I came to know the Lord, whether they agree with me or not, I can only speak about what happened to me. This one thing I know is as a 15-year-old boy, I was one thing. Now I'm something different. And you want to know what changed me? It was a man named Jesus Christ. Changed everything. It's the one thing that I do know. It's one thing that I can testify with boldness to a world that seems to know so little. Friends and Grace Baptist Church members, can I just remind you tonight? If you know Christ as your Savior, you are God's handiwork. You're God's handiwork. And that is something that you ought to testify about. The one thing that you know. You know, God has the ability to work and continues to work miracles in our lives. And these wonderful things are not to be hidden. They're not to be kept in secret. They're to be broadcast. And with that, I say this. Testify. Talk to people about the work that God has done in your heart and life and let them know that God can do a work in their lives as well. I'll tell you what I do know. That God has changed my life through his son, Jesus Christ. In closing, let me give you three observations about this story. The first one is this. As we consider our story of this blind man that gets healed, as we consider the great thing that, that God had done in his life, the first observation I want you to note is not everyone will understand your relationship with the Lord. His parents didn't understand. His family didn't understand. The acquaintances that saw him day after day, they didn't understand. The religious crowd, or if you want to put it this way, their church, nobody understood. And can I tell you, when God does a work in your life, not everybody's going to understand. Look, my friends and family, when, when I gave my life to the Lord and felt God calling me and left Gaylord, Michigan to go all the way down to Knoxville, Tennessee, to go to Bible college, to go to Christian college. I don't mind telling you this. My friends and family, those that love me, thought I'd lost my mind. They weren't mean to me, but they certainly didn't understand what God was doing in my heart and life. They might understand now. And I say that to tell you this. Not everybody's going to understand the great work that God's doing in your life. This man could now see it was obvious hello there's a major change here but even though not everyone will understand our relationship with the lord nonetheless we still have something to say and an obligation to testify about what we do know thank god for the early disciples not being afraid to testify they were bold and can i tell you something we ought to be bold today Second observation before I close. Not only did not not only will not everyone understand and misunderstand your relationship with the Lord, but secondly, we are never alone. The Lord the Lord always seems to circle back. In our story, our man that was healed is cast out. For all that we know, no friends, no family, they've all cast him out. He's all by himself. The Bible says in John chapter 9, verse 35, Jesus heard that they had cast him out, 
And when he had found him, Jesus went seeking for him. When all the world ran out on this guy and left him out and cast him out, Jesus went and found him. And he said unto him, Dost thou believe on the Son of God? You think seeing is wonderful? Wait till you see what God's going to do when you believe on him as your Savior. You know, Job suffered greatly at the hand of Satan, didn't he, if you know the story. He also suffered from scrutiny from his wife, his family and friends, acquaintances. I mean, they ripped on him. As a matter of fact, Job's even quoted for saying, there are people that give me a hard time and that look down at me in scorn, and I wouldn't even let my dogs hang out with them. Yet he was never alone, was he? God was there all along. And as the Lord does so often, when he's working and others don't understand, he circles back. Just like he circled back to this man in our story and went and found him, he circled back to Job. Do you remember that? The Bible says at the end of the book of Job, the final few verses says, So the Lord blessed the latter end of Job more than his beginning, for he had 14,000 sheep, 6,000 camels, 1,000 yoke of oxen, 1,000 she-asses, and he had seven sons and three daughters. I mean, God gave it all back to him. And the Bible says in verse number 16, and he lived, and after this, lived Job 140 years and saw his sons and his sons' sons even four generations. So Job died being old and full of days. Isn't that beautiful? We find that not everyone will understand your relationship with the Lord. Secondly, we learn that we're never alone. The Lord always seems to circle back. He circled back to this guy. He circled back to Job. He'll circle back to you. And last, not only will people misunderstand your relationship with the Lord, not only are we never alone, the Lord will circle back. The third observation is a miracle is performed. I was thinking about this. At the end of the day, a man who had been born blind and lived his whole life, and now he's a man, forced to beg and be at the mercy of others, at the end of the day, this guy can see. Regardless of whatever, whatever anyone thought or said, he can see. This man received a personal miracle. And I think in the story, the miracle gets lost because of his parents and because of the spectators, because of the Pharisees, because he was healed on the Sabbath day. But not this man. This man knew exactly what had been done. Take all the semantics of the story out, and at the end of the day, an amazing miracle had been performed. His life was changed, and no one could tell him different. The world may not want us Excuse me, the world may want us to water things down and to quiet down a little bit and to change our message, but this man was only telling his story. He was only testifying what God had done for you. And can I tell you in your life, all the loud noise that goes on and all the crazy things that go around, at the end of the day, if you know Christ is your Savior and you've been born again, then you know that a miracle was performed inside and you can't help it. You've got to say something. If you know the Lord and he has saved you and blessed you, we are simply asked to tell our story, to testify. It may be the only thing we really know in life. And here's what's so wonderful about that. It's a God thing. And that is worth it saying something about. Let's pray together. Father, we love you. What a joy it is to be able to teach this evening. And I pray that, God, you'd take this thought, this study number four in our One Thing series, just one word, testify. God, you've done a miracle in our lives. May we tell others about it. I pray that you'll use this in the hearts and lives of of tonight's viewers, we pray in Jesus' name, amen. Once again, I want to thank you for tuning in uh, to this week's midweek service. 
Um, we don't have in-person services this week. Uh, this is our midweek Bible study. We'll be online Sunday morning, Sunday night. You can go to our Facebook page. You can see what I'll be preaching on. It's the beginning of our Chris Myth Busters series. That'll begin Sunday morning and Sunday night. Next Wednesday, we'll meet online at 7 o'clock. And then December, Sunday, December 6th, we'll be assembling together again. We'll still be on Facebook and YouTube and 88.1, but we'll be resuming our in-person services. We'll be getting this week and the beginning of next week, getting the whole platform decorated for Christmas. We've got some other new, newer decorations that we raised money for that'll be out front and <clears throat> we'll be on the, the glass that's separating the lobby from the auditorium. I think it's gonna be beautiful. We're excited. We're gonna be doing our operation, Bless the Police. And I want you to be getting ready uh, to be partaking in that. Uh, don't forget, send in your extra donations for the uh, our Christmas gifts to Gaylord that we're working on and uh, be faithful in your giving. Be faithful in your walk with the Lord. Looking forward to seeing you soon. Have a wonderful, happy Thanksgiving. May God bless you.